wait on the Lord. But don't just wait. Be of good courage. Don't just have courage, but have good courage. Come on and put your hands together and give God some more praise. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And the Lord will strengthen your heart. Wait on the Lord, I say. Wait on the Lord. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful song to lift our hearts. There's nothing like music, and there's certainly nothing like music in our church. Amen? Put your hands together for this wonderful, 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 wonderful music ministry. And certainly I want to give God all the praise and the honor for this invitation and for this opportunity and for those of you who press your way, even in the midst of all the kinds of things that we are hearing and all the threats, amen, and all the very genuine and real concerns, but nevertheless, amen, if there's ever been a time that we needed the Lord, we sure do need the Lord now, right now, amen, and that's nothing like pressing your way to the house of God. Many of you, I'm sure, coming from work and from other kinds of obligations, but it's just good, as, as, as uh, Dr. Fentress Williams already said, it's just good to be in the house of God. One more time. Amen. Amen. Just one more time. He didn't have to let me live. The Lord didn't have to let me live. Amen. But I'm just glad to be in the service. It's not because we've crossed every T and dotted every I. Not because we did everything right. Amen. But because our God is merciful and kind and generous and gracious. Come on, God, that, that, the, that, that God look beyond our faults. Come on, anybody here guilty? Any guilty people? Anybody guilty? Say, but you look beyond my idiosyncrasies and look beyond my foibles and look beyond my faults and saw that I needed a Savior. Amen. Come on and praise God one more time. I need you, God. I thank you. All the way in the balcony, we say thank you. We bless your name, God, and we are grateful, amen, grateful to be here, delighted, amen, for safe travel from Nashville, uh, Tennessee, and I'm delighted. I, I honor your pastor. I honor your pastor in this season of Sabbath and say la for him and for a kind of congregation. I just want you to know that you are modeling across the, con across the country, amen, uh, in the importance of uh, giving pastors the permission uh, to, to have a break before they break down. Amen. To let them break, have a break, have a, have a Sabbath. And so I honor the Lord for Alfred Street, but certainly for your pastor, who is a tremendous man of God and who loves this, loves this ministry, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. Won't you join me in thanking God for him? Amen. Yeah. I know who the pastor is. And so for his able assistants and other ministers and staff, I know that in order for this to happen, there are a number of people who are working in the background. And so a tremendous, this ministry has a tremendous staff of people and a tremendous, uh, from the security, amen, all the way from security and the outdoor parking lot and the people upstairs. And certainly, but I want to thank God for all the ministers on the staff here who are so warm and so kind. But certainly I would be remiss if I, if I did not make a special plug for my own colleague, the Reverend Dr. Judith uh, Fentress Williams, my colleague in Old Testament Hebrew Bible. I thank God for her, for her gifts, for her graciousness, for her scholarship. Thank God because I, I know that uh, it, it, there, are, uh, there are rare ones of us, the truth of the matter, rare ones of us who keep our foot in the church and the academy. Uh, because the academy and the church are two jealous lovers. They are jealous lovers. They hate each other in some ways. The academy don't know why we're in the church, and the church can't understand why we want to go over there into the academy. And so that she loves this church, she loves this ministry, she loves this pastor, but above all, she loves the Lord. Amen. Give God some praise. And so in addition to being a professor, she loves this church. Come on and give God some praise for her. Mm. 
I know the time is, I know where I am, and I, I, I know what you've got to do tomorrow, and I know what I've got to do tomorrow, uh, but I do honor that this is part of your revival. I assume also slash Bible study. I assume also slash whatever I want to do tonight. Amen. <laughs> whatever way the Lord comes. And I also want to uh, just mention uh, your online uh, live streaming and how wonderful it is across the country, so much so that th Tuesday night is our Bible study at the Ray of Hope Community Church in Nashville, and I usually teach the Bible study, and so we, we put online this morning that in lieu of Bible study, you are to live stream Afro Street, amen, <laughs> so <laughs> amen, uh, leave your offering at the right place, amen, amen. <laughs> But I want to thank God for the Ray of Hope who should be online tonight and, and introducing them to Afro Street and this great choir and, and certainly seeing me. And, and, and I'll, be having, I'll be giving them an exam after tonight. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I do invite you to turn with me to the Old Testament book of Numbers, the 27th chapter, verses 1 through 12. Uh, and it is a, it, it's, it's 12 verses. It, it is 12 verses. Amen. It's 12 verses. That's right. It, but it is in the Bible. Amen. But it is in the Bible. So uh, Numbers uh, 27 verses 1 through 12. And I am reading from the NIV or New International. You may have New King James, King James, NRSV, any number of others. But follow along with me, if you will. Now, the daughters of Zelophehad, son of Hepher, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, belonged to the clans of Manasseh, son of Joseph. And the names of the daughters were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Tirzah. And they came forward uh, to, and stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the leaders, and the whole assembly at the entrance to the tent of meetings. And they said, listen, our fathers died our father died in the wilderness. He was not among Korah's followers who, who banded together against the Lord, but he died for his own sins and left no, but left no sons. And why should our father's name disappear from his clan? Because he has no son. Give us our property or give us an inheritance among our father's relatives. So Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord said to him, What Zelophehad's daughters are saying is right. You must certainly give them property as an inheritance among their father's relatives and give their father's inheritance to them. Say to the Israelites, If a man dies and leaves no son, give his inheritance to his daughter. If he has no daughter, give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father had no brothers, give his inheritance to the nearest relative in his clan that he may possess it. This is to have the force of the law for the Israelites as the Lord commanded Moses. Thus far our scripture. God, we bless you and we honor you. Shine. Let your light from heaven shine. Illumine, confront, challenge, teach, correct, console, comfort. And we will not fail to give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. And the people of God will, together will say, Amen. God uses hidden figures. God uses hidden figures. Says Brian Zahn in a book that we're using as a part of our uh, Lenten season devotion this season at my church in his book, The Unvarnished Jesus. Brian Zahn says, our broken world likes to divide people into big people and little people. The rich and the famous are the big people. The poor and the marginalized are the little people. We live in a society that loves to divide people and loves to divide the country between the haves and the have-nots. The rich and the famous are the big people. 
The important and the influential are the big people. This is how we talk. We are smitten with so-called big people. Uh, they, we, we love their big names, their, influential, their influence, the, the people who get the top billings, front row seats, the stars, and those who play leading roles in drama. Bigness is a part of our national religion here in the U.S. And yet the story of our Bible, the story of our faith, the story, the Christian narrative is a story about how God uses ordinary people, not so big people, people that nobody else notices and others absolutely ignore and the invisible people, the ordinary. Uh, we live in a culture that celebrates big names, stars, amen, influential people, uh, 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 people with a lot of money. But the story of the Bible is the story about a God who uses the invisible people, the small, so-called small people, the, the bit players, the character players, the, the, the one-line people, the people who don't have much to say, who just walk in and bring a tray and walk out of the room. God uses ordinary people. Uh, uh, history, uh, we, we, our whole history of this country can be explained by the notion of what we call in the academy the great man theory, the, that, that, that history is impacted and history is shaped by great men or great heroes and highly influential and unique individuals and because of outstanding intellect and heroic courage or divine inspiration. The, our history, history is written from the point of view of so-called great men, men uh, and even women who stood out because of their intellect and their courage and they are seen as having the decisive effect on history and their greatest contributions to civilization. But I submit to you uh, uh, that, that we serve a God uh, uh, who sees things very differently and that God has shaped history uh, not just so much with the big name people but with some very uh, small name people and some of us know some of those people in our own lives uh, that we have been shaped by people whose names will never be on the billboard never be on the, the cornerstone of the church will never find its way into a bulletin amen whose names and whose positions Positions are, are unknown, but we know how much they meant to us, and we know what they did for us, and we know how they prayed for us, and we know how they were behind us. Do I have a witness in here? Uh, the, the Bible is full of stories of those kinds of people, and we would do well here in this season right now uh, to know that the Bible says that we look on the outward appearance, but I'm here to tell you that God looks at the heart. I dropped by to tell you that you can close the apps on your phones or turn off the cable news and stop your dependence upon big names because you're going to miss if you are always looking at who gets the Academy Awards and, and who's on uh, NAACP Image Awards. And if you're always scrolling through your app to see what Beyonce is doing and, and what Jay is doing and, and what clothes they are wearing, I'm going to tell you that if your eyes is always glued on media, you you're going to miss who God is using and you're going to miss who God is sending into your life and you're going to miss who you're sitting next to and you're going to miss who God is sending to bless you and you're going to miss the so-called small people. I'm here to tell you that most of your blessings are not going to come. In fact, they're, they're, I don't even know if you're going to get any blessings from the big folk. It's going to be small people who are going to bless you. It's going to be a school teacher. Do I have a witness? It's going to be somebody cleaning the bathroom who's going to bless you. It's, somebody, it's the lady who wears a net on her head and is feeding you at the cafeteria. That's who's going to bless you. Do I have a witness here? It's the people who scrub in the bathroom that's going to bless you. It's, not, it's the, bus, the, the bus driver who's going to bless you. You better take your eyes off the big folks. Uh, it's going to be the small people that God is going to use to make contributions. We look at the outward appearance, but God has a whole nother calculus of calculations on who God uses and how God you. God has been known to do some extraordinary things in history with little known people. 
The story that gets turned into a movie doesn't always tell the whole story. The history that is told from the point of view of winners do not always tell the whole story. Uh, 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 it, it, because, you know that because before 2017, most of us had never heard of Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson. And some of you in here are hearing the names now and you still don't know who they were. But these were, as, the, as Katherine Johnson said, they were the computer with skirts uh, back in the uh, 60s and 70s. We didn't know the women who were the mathematical brains behind some of the greatest operations in history. The launch of John Glenn into orbit and the relaunch in this nation's space program. We didn't know that these women existed. We didn't know their contributions. We didn't know that it was even possible to be who they were and do what they did until the movie Hidden Figures came out. Until the movie starring Taraji uh, Henson, particularly as, as Miss, Ka Miss Johnson, who just died last week, amen, uh, last month rather, at 101 years old. Uh, she became the first uh, black woman, uh, one of the few of a handful of black women and a small cadre of black women working, perhaps they say three dozen, who at the middle of last century served as mathematicians for the space agency. Somebody is learning something right now. Ah, uh, uh, they, 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 according to the New York Times, I love how they eulogize her. They say they asked Katherine Johnson for the moon and she gave it to them. <laughs> Wielding little more than a pencil. Anybody remember a pencil? <laughs> I just want to know, do you remember? I'm, I'm talking to about, uh, let me look out here. Yeah, yeah, you know about a pencil. Yep, 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 yep. A slide rule. God knows a slide rule. <laughs> I didn't know how to use it, but I do remember it. Amen. <laughs> Uh, as she calculated the precise trajectories that would let Apollo 11 land on the moon in 1969 and later when Neil Armstrong history making moonwalk it left uh, returned to the earth and yet in all those 33 years of working for NASA and decades afterward almost no one knew her name God uses hidden figures her name and the other names of Dorothy Vaughn and Miss Jackson. If, in case you hadn't heard, it's Women's History Month. In case you've been under a rock, it's also the Lytton season. And as we enter the month of March, or as we're now almost in the middle of the month of March, we and commemorate these 40 days of Lent. Traditionally, this is a time, and the last time I was here, it was during March, and that important season uh, is a time of prayer and meditation and spiritual renewal. But Lent also represents uh, a time for as a, as a people of faith with a challenge, one that directs our attention toward God in spite of the everyday chaos in our lives. And in the Lenten season, that's why I believe God gave me this passage of all the passages. I should be in New Testament. I should be talking about Jesus. I should be talking about uh, uh, the, the march to the cross. But, 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 but when God dropped this one in my spirit, I, it was like God was saying, it, this is also a time of repentance. It is also a time of introspection when we recalibrate and figure out what is real important and who is really important and we look around and ask ourselves during the Lenten season as we make our march toward Easter or Resurrection Sunday morning and we ask God create in me a clean heart and renew in me the right spirit and who are the people that I have overlooked and, and who are the people that I have forgotten and why and, and in my and my haste uh, to hang out with the rich folks and the important folks Folks, and they're like, now. who God doing this seat bring to my attention who have I neglected who I, I, I am I, I, I'm amazed I've, I'm, I, I, I spend as a, as, a, as a pastor and also as a pastor's wife but also as a co-pastor I am deliberate I am intentional uh, at the end of service uh, about looking for whoever is standing in the lobby that nobody is shaking their hands I, I, I just always go to the one
ones that nobody is paying any attention to. I'm always in my spirit because I remember being that person. I, I remember being at the church and, and folks would step over me to go, to, go, to go shake hands with somebody else and how they would nudge me just to say hello to the big and the important people. I know I had on a raggedy dress. I, I know as a little girl that I had plaits going all in every direction and I know that my socks were going down in the bottom of my shoe but I said to God and a few black folks if I ever if I ever get to be anything I'm going to look for the small people. I, I'm going to look for the people with ashy legs. I, I'm going to look for the little girl with the snot going down her nose. I, I'm going to look for the little boy who got raggedy jeans on. I, I, because I remember being that person that nobody wanted to shake my hand because I didn't have pedigree. You would think that in church we would pay attention. You would think that in church, surely we don't treat people in church the way we are treated on our jobs. But people can stand and say that they are visitors. But if they're not a big muckety muck, we are not going over there to shake their hands. We're going to go to the muckety mucks before we come over. Oh, by the way, come on here. Somebody say God created me a clean heart. So you can. And so, and so it is appropriate here this, 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 in this revival of uh, here at the Afro Street Church that we would take some time and, and perhaps look at it. And, I, and I'm, I'm clear that with a, with a Hebrew Bible scholar in, in your midst, I'm sure that at some point in, the, in all of the years that Dr. Fentress Williams has been here, you've heard this, this particular passage. But for the average church. You can spend your entire life, and I may be talking about my own self, Red Hope, because I don't know if I've ever preached this at the Red Hope Church, but hold that thought. I'll be right there on Sunday. Amen. You, you can spend your entire life in church and never hear the story here in Numbers 27. You won't find this story in any lectionary or in your typical Lenten devotional or Bible study reading. The story of Zelophehad's daughters. A man by the name of Zelophehad died and he left behind five daughters and no sons. If, 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 the, if, the, uh, if the tragic death of, of Kobe uh, Bryant taught us anything, it, it made us sensitive to fathers and sons. Just that we even had a whole hashtag to go viral right after the, the, his, his tragic death along with his daughter taking her uh, uh, back and forth to her basketball practices. But the Bible, it is in a, story, in a book that otherwise is, it hails all the stories about sons and hails all the stories and celebrates all the stories about mothers and sons and fathers and sons and rightly so and importantly so. But here is one of those rare stories. There's only a few stories where there is a story about daughters. Amen. Uh, daughters. Amen. Daughters. Amen. Uh, uh, the, the, it is a story about these unknown women, these five girls, uh, fatherless and manless in a patriarchal society. And the rules were clear. Sons and daughters. Sons could inherit their father's land. Daughters could not. So you would say that Zelophehad's daughters were uh, let's see, what's the good word? Uh, they, were, they, 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 they were being oppressed. Uh, let me, uh, I'll say it like that. Uh, uh, but, but they did not let them stop them. The rule wasn't fair. I hope you go with me here tonight. It would mean if they allowed the rule, the law to stand and go unchallenged, it would mean that they had no inheritance in the promised land because they are now outside Moses and the Eliezer and the the tent of meeting is outside the promised land. They're getting ready to go into the promised land and the boys are in the tent of meeting dividing up the land. <laughs> oh God, let me go right there. And the boys are in the meeting <laughs> dividing up the land and the boys are in the meeting <laughs> dividing up the land <laughs> uh, and the boys are in the meeting dividing up the land just chilling, dividing up the land. Ah, <laughs> uh, but the loaf of heads daughters <laughs> 
uh, the gathering of the tribes, everybody, all the men folk are there. And the book of Numbers is about the census. Is it about numbers? It is about the census. And so while I'm talking about the census, I want y'all to make sure in 2010 and 20 that you do the census because it's important. I wish I could go there, but just make sure you, you go find Pukinim and get Pukinim counted in the census. You get Madeira, amen. Go get Juan and go get Poquita, get everybody, amen. Go get the people in the census, amen. Call all your people in the house, even the ones who owe you rent, get them in the census. They're on the edge of the promised land and is now about to divvy up the promised land. And they are there and they're about to take a census. And the point of the census is to decide which tribes will get the land. And also the point of the census is also to determine who are of, 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 of 20 years or older who can go to war. Uh, but the point here that I want us to understand is that in this time of the men meeting at the, at the tent of meeting, uh, making decisions about the future, and even though it is a patriarchal culture, here comes five girls. <laughs> oh, Lord, here comes five females. <laughs> oh, Lord, nothing men like <laughs> hate more than when women come and mess up their situations. <laughs> Here comes a fight. Nothing men hate more than when they're having together and they're getting together and they're in their den and then they're watching their games and they're about to do their thing. And here comes five girls. Oh, I love this story. I love this story. I love this story. <laughs> And they, have, and, they, and they have divided up the, the land for Reuben, and they've divided up the land for Simeon, and they've divided up the land for Gad and for Judah, and they get to the seventh tribe, according to numbers here, and the tribe of Manasseh, and it says, but Manasseh had no sons. And, 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 and as the census was concluded, uh, God, even God instructs Moses, among these shall the land be apportioned according to the share. Zalofa had it says, however, in verse 33, had no sons, but he did have daughters. I'm glad to be able to preach that this morning, this evening, because I am a daughter, a daddy's girl, and, and there is something about being a daddy's girl, and I'm here to tell you that I just believe that Zalofa Head may have died, but his girls were daddy's girls. I want you to know something. There is, daddies do have an influence on their daughters. Uh, you can tell a, a girl who's been raised by a father. Who, uh, there is a confidence about her. There is a kind of strength about her. Oh, I wish I could stay all day at this point right here. But I just believe that the reason that these five women went to the tent of meeting is because they were their father's daughters. It's because they knew what they were inherited. And they knew what their rights were. And they were not scared of Moses. And they were not scared of Eliezer. And they were not scared of a room full of men and they did not care about negotiating and they were not ner they didn't get tied on because they were daddy's girls <laughs> because they knew uh, that they had power and they knew how to negotiate let me tell you something before I get to another point you don't get what you deserve you get what you negotiate You don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. I know you got dimples, but baby, you're gonna have to learn how to negotiate. I know you cute, and oh, you so fine. Ah, but we ain't giving you a promotion based on your cuteness. You're gonna have to know how to negotiate. You're not gonna get that salary that you want based on the fact that you still a size 12. You're gonna get it because you know how to go in a room and tell Moses, this is what I bring to the table. You're going to have to negotiate it. In a patriarchal culture, they ain't going to give you nothing. You're going to have to learn how to negotiate. Put your hands together and give God some praise. And so they came 
I love these five women who came together. And the Bible names them because it is about a census and it is about land dis distribution. Mela, Nola, Hogla, Milka, and Tilza. And they came as a group. They were together. They weren't arguing. They weren't disagreeing. Because when you go going up against the establishment and the status quo, we got to have solidarity. It can't be, a, it is, it can't be the progressives versus the liberals versus the conservatives. Come on. It can't be the old generation versus the young generation. Generation. It can't be those who for Sanders versus those who are for Elizabeth Warren against those who are for Biden. It's got to be united we stand and united and divided we fall. You got to go in that uh, 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 together and not disagree. And I love the, the, the put together, put, uh, put, put down the lie that women can't get along. I love this story because all five of these sisters were clicking at the same time. And I'm telling you, they came in there. Oh, they are hidden figures. They came in there and they clearly, because when you're going to come in together, you all, you got to decide now who's going to do what and who's going to do what. I, because maybe I'm stronger at beginning the conversation, but I may not be strong at ending the conversation. I may be stronger at the middle point of the negotiation, but you may be stronger to ask for what you need to ask for. Because you see, I may be good at getting at telling them why they wrong. But that don't mean I know how to ask for what I think you ought to give me. But you, it's good to have somebody else in there. Am I teaching tonight? Am I teaching tonight? Am I teaching tonight? You got to have people with multiple skills. Somebody got to know how to do something other than what you know how to do. Do I have a witness in here? Put your hand together and give God some praise. Male dominance was assumed as part of the natural order, says Tikvah Frema. So the Bible has a new religious vision, but it does not have a radical new social vision. It is a male-dominated society. But the Bible tells us that that did not deter these women. That's where I ultimately want to go. I don't care what the law says. I don't care what the status quo is. I don't care what the customs and the tradition is. I don't care what the politics of the office is. I don't care what the culture of the church is. The overhead daughter says everything can change. <laughs> the overhead daughter said, I don't care what they, I don't care, because by the time they, they love to pull the law on us. They love to tell us what can't be done. <laughs> they love to tell us what they don't have no more. <laughs> they love to tell us why we came late. <laughs> ah, but the loverhead daughter said, oh, no, 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 no. Laws can be made and laws can be changed. <laughs> laws can be constructed and laws can be deconstructed. Come on and give God some praise. There is no such thing as this is just the way it is. You can't take no. You don't take no. When you go into the tent of meetings, you got to decide, I'm coming out of there with something. I may not get everything I want, but I'm coming out of there with something. Turn to somebody and say, you better come out of there with something. Come on, you got to spell it, something. It's S-U-M, -S apostrophe, U-N, something. Don't walk away empty-handed. Decide where your ceiling is and where your flow is. That we're going to walk away with something. Amen. And the Bible tells us that they made an argument. Oh, God, I've got to keep going. I've got to, I've got, I know it's 807, so let me just hush on her and rush on here. Uh, but I love what they do. And they say, listen. See, because when, you, when, you, when you're arguing with the enemy, when you're dealing with the devil, you, you, know, you, got to, you, got to, you got to talk the way the devil understands talking. I love that they did not get in there, uh, Dr. Fentress, with a theological argument. They ain't even mentioned God. You see, there are some demons you don't even call God's name. 
You just got to go with power. Amen. Something going to come out in another kind of way. Uh, but they went there and they made an economic argument because they knew that that's what, that's what Moses would understand. And so they went not with a moral argument, not with a political argument, not with a theological argument. They say, listen, if, I, if you take away our father's land, he'll have. And they knew the law of patrimony. And if you take away our father's land, we know, you know that the, the tribe will be reduced. The clan will suffer. The created order will be compromised. So why just because our father did not have any sons so should his land be forfeited and given to somebody else? And they made such a precise argument. I'm talking to women who gets in media and we got to start crying and our voice goes up here. You got to be very clear about what you're getting ready to say. I don't care if you got to take Ativan and I leave and ibuprofen. I don't care if you need a little glass of bourbon, but you better get up in there and look them dead in the eye. I need you to be serious. I need you to be focused. Our legacy is on the line. Our history is on the line. Our people is on the line. Our future is on the line. Get yourself together and come on in here. And the Bible says, <laughs> Moses changed his mind. And the Bible said that Moses said, <laughs> and he went back and even God said to Moses, what the daughters of Zelophehad have said to you is right. Come on here and give God some praise that even Moses had to change. I can go home on that right there. But here is the lesson. There's two lessons I want to share with you. Moses, the great prophet. Moses, the inspiration behind the first five books. Moses, the lawgiver. Moses, the priest. Uh, but, be, but behind all these great men are always great women whom God used to set the stage. I want to say this again. We know Moses as the lawgiver, but we also learn tonight who are the real lawgivers. Moses gets the front line. Uh, but there were some women in the background who was telling him, no, this ain't right right here. But here. This ain't the word of God concerning my life right here. I believe you need to move this and move that. Won't you know that, 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 that Martin King only stood up after Rosa Parks sat down? I know y'all don't want to hear that, but I want you to know, I want you to know that before Moses was the Hebrew midwives, before Moses was Miriam, his sister, before, before with Moses was the daughters of Zelophehad. We see the big name, ah, but God uses the hidden figures to set the stage. We see Moses, but we forget about the midwives and we forget about Miriam and we forget about Zelophehad. Put your hands together and give God some praise. You see, I tell people all the time that I always, my little young sister here who finished Princeton, don't write your resume and believe your resume. <laughs> see, because people will introduce you and you know you wrote the resume, but behind every resume is some stuff that never gets told. The resume is about the jobs that you got. <laughs> The resume never tells about the job that you didn't get. The resume is always about your accomplishments. The resume does not tell about your failures. The resume is always about uh, the wonderful and the big flashy things. It don't tell, uh, it tells that you finished Princeton. It don't tell that you barely finished Princeton. It, it tells that you went to Hampton. It don't say that the registrar didn't even want to give you your, give you your diploma and you did come back four weeks later after mama got a check to pay for the diploma. It don't tell the whole story. There's a story. And then there's the story behind the story. Come on and give God some praise. It's talking about the little people. It's about 
knowing that my parents did not have money to send me to Wellesley College, this Ivy League college in Massachusetts, and they did not even have enough money to go with me up there. So they sent me there and raised all the money and got me a Sears and Roebuck trunk. Somebody know what I'm talking about. I said Sears and Roebuck. And put all my worldly good and sent me to Boston. And the one thing I would not forget that my stepmother, who didn't even finish the 10th grade, said to me, Nita, you know we don't have any money, but we're sending you up there. and We don't have the money even to go up there with you. We're going to raise all the money just to get you up there. And we don't know when we're going to be able to send you money. We're not one of those families that can send you money every month. But I tell you what, if you just go into the kitchen, you're going to find somebody in the cafeteria. <laughs> And if you just go in and if you know how to say good morning to her, and if you ask her how she doing, and if you ask, if you tell her thank you, ma'am, she'll put some chicken on the side for you until I can send you some money, until your daddy and I find some money. She'll take care of you and feed you if you know how to treat her right, if you know how to say good morning to her. So I went into the kitchen. Hey, Miss Mary, how you doing? <laughs> and she said, baby, I'll see you at the end of the hour. But in all ways, there was a plate wrapped in aluminum foil. Uh, and I had all the chicken and the biscuits. Uh, come on, uh, and macaroni and cheese, because I know how to treat hidden figures. Put your hands together and give God some praise. Your, your children don't need an American Express, they need manners. They don't need a Visa and a MasterCard. They, know, they need to know how to treat people. Good morning and thank you, ma'am, will open more doors than an American Express will ever. Come on and give God some praise. Hidden figures. Little people, little people, little people, and also lips, and the women spoke up. There are some things in life, there are a lot of things in life you're going to have to open your mouth for. Nobody can read your mind. You're going to have to say what it is that you want and what you need. These hidden figures spoke up. They went to the tent of meetings and they did not stutter. They argued law. They spoke up. They were scared, but they spoke up anyway. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's what you do in spite of fear. I open my mouth to the Lord and I won't turn back. And so there were little people, but they learned to use their mouth. You've got to learn how to open your mouth and talk and speak. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. And finally, uh, there were women not only, and I'm, I'm just jettisoning this because we're trying to go. It is not only little people. It was not only the law that they understood and knew how. It was also, if you look at the story of, of the Montgomery boy, bus boycott. I know we look at E.D. Nixon, and I know we look at Martin Luther King, and rightly so. Uh, but what we forget are the hidden figures of the women. The women who belonged to the Women's Political Caucus. Um, it was not just Martin King and Edie Nixon who organized the Boys Boy County. It was women like Joanne Robertson. It was women uh, uh, who worked. Uh, and I love the story of Joanne Robertson. She was a school teacher at Alabama State. And the night that Rosa Parks sat down, she knew that that was the moment to get Edie Nixon and Martin Luther King galvanized, get them galvanized, convince them. Come on, boys. Yo, we can do this right here. We can do it. We can do it. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Oh, come on, baby. Come on, baby. And the, the story said that she went to Alabama State at night and she ran all, all over uh, some 3,000 mimeographed. I'm talking to somebody who remembers. Can you smell it right now? I can, 
Oh, Lord, I almost got a smell of the mimograph machine. And she mimeographed her announcement saying, we are not taking the bus tomorrow. We're going to find you and we'll pick you up and take you to your jobs. And she stayed up all night long. And the women met her that morning. And they went from bus stop to bus stop to bus stop saying, we ain't taking no bus. I'm trying to tell you about the hidden figures. There is the Martin King, but there is the Joanne Robinson and the women of the Women's Political Caucus. Come on here and give God some praise. There are the men and then there are the women who are working in the background. Do I have a witness? Hidden figures. Do I have any hidden figures in the room right now? Come on and give God some praise. And do you not know, finally, that this law, the law that was instituted through the, through the efforts of the, of the Zephyr Zelophehead's daughters, that in fact this case has been named and is continued to be named and cited as the oldest case still cited as an authority in the American Bar Association Journal of February 1924, there is an article citing this case and describing it as an early declaratory judgment in which the property rights of women are clearly set forth. I'm trying to tell you about your legacy. <laughs> what do you, this, they didn't just do it for themselves, but I want this not just for myself. I didn't want to go to Princeton just for myself. I didn't want a PhD just for myself. I wanted it for uh, uh, so that Judy Fitris Williams could come behind me and, and so that others could come behind me. I'm talking about a legacy. Come on here, somebody. You got to have something that's larger than just you and your children and your nieces and nephew. We're talking about those who are coming behind. Do I have a witness in here? Come on and give God some praise. What Zelophehead's daughters changed women's property right. Come on, every woman here who owns something, who's got something, who got something in your own name. Every man in here who wants that for his daughter. Come on and give God some praise. Open your mouth and say thank you. Thank you for my mama, and thank you for my grandmama, and thank you for my auntie, and thank you for my school teachers. Come on, God uses hidden figures to make a way for you, to open doors for you. Come on and give God some praise up in here. And they persisted, and they persisted, and they changed Moses' mind. They changed Eliezer's mind. They even changed God's mind. Come on and give God some praise. They were like the Canaanite woman who went before Jesus and changed Jesus' mind. They were like Esther who went before Ahasuerus and changed Ahasuerus' mind. Come on and give God some praise. They were like the women who early that Sunday morning, they went and told Peter and the disciples, he's not dead, he's yet alive. Open your mouth, women. You can change history. You can right the wrongs. You can bring down laws. Come on and give God some praise. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the little people, thank you for the people who made a way for me, thank you for the people I don't even remember, thank you God, I want to thank you for every colored school teacher who taught me my nine times table, I want to thank you God for every colored school teacher who taught me how to diagram sentences. I, I want to thank you, God, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for my mama and my grandmama and my aunties and my grandfather and the deacon at my church. I want to say thank you. Truth. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown stands God. I don't care about the wrong of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. There's a God who sits high and looks low. Come on and give God some praise. I don't care what laws they pass, and I don't care what laws they break. There is a God who sits high 
and looks low. Come on and give God some praise. I don't care what they're doing. <laughs> Come on, somebody. As scared as I get sometimes, I know that laws are made and laws can be changed. If you get the right people doing what they're supposed to be doing. But there is a God. And I thank God. I'm going down with this God. I'm in too deep now. I'm in too deep now. Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about. I've been with God too long now. I didn't walk with God too long now. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. Do I have a witness? Come on up in here, somebody. I once was young, and now I'm old. Come on and praise God right now. I believe Jesus is going to make a way. Come on, God, you got to fix this thing. If you did it for my mama, surely you would do it for me. If you did it, if they could raise nine children on $50 a week, surely. We ain't got to eat shrimp every day. Ain't nothing wrong with peanut butter and jelly. And before this food gets out of 1600, you're going to get to know neck bones again. You're going to get to know spam and ramen noodles again. And you're going to say, thank you, Lord, because I know what it is to have and I know what it is not to have. And in all things, I give praises to God. Come on and praise God in this place right now. Come on, everybody who know what it is to have nothing. God, we say thank you. As we lift our hands right now, you promise never to leave us. So we thank you. I thank you right now, God. I thank you for the hidden figures. I thank you for the people that we don't even know who's working, who you are using to work on our behalf. I thank you, God, that while we are we are complaining about being not having leaders, I thank you, God, that you brought to my own remembrance as I was working on this sermon that you've got people in, in places already doing things. Thank you for Black Lives Matter, and I thank you for Alicia Garza, and I thank you, come on here, somebody. I thank you, I thank you for Cheryl Lynn Eiffel over the Legal Defense Fund. I, I say thank you, God. I thank you for Bishop Barber and the pe poor people and the Moral Monday. I say thank you. God said, I got hidden figures. Get out of this cave. I've got folks who have not bowed to Baal that I got working on your behalf. You may not know who they are, but God knows who they are. And we say thank you. Come on, I've got, I've got Stacey Abram organizing Fair Fight. Come on and give God some praise. I've got Zalofa Head's daughters who are working on your behalf. And we say thank you. Come on and praise God one more time before I sit down. Come on, I need you to, I know God needs you to do it thunderously. Say, I may not see them. Come on right now, your children's future are being secure because there are people in the trenches that you don't even know about. While you watching MSNBC being scared, God's got folks working, going before in high places. And we say thank you. And we say thank you. We say thank you. Put your hands together and give God some praise. Ooh-wee! That worship touched my soul. I hope it touched yours as well. Listen, I want to thank you for watching, for worshiping, and for being part of our witness today. If the word of God and the worship moved upon your heart and you want to continue to support the great things that God is doing at Alfred Street, you can give electronically, online, through our app, or even our text to give option. I once heard a sermon, and afterwards someone said, is the sermon done? And the usher's response was, the sermon's over, but it has yet to be done. You just received a word from the Lord. Worship's over. Now let's go live the word and get it done. It's Pastor Wesley. See you next worship service.